Yo, my peoples, what's up? My name is Jason, and I'm from the Shelf Stories YouTube channel. And I'm here with you today with another installment in my Games for a Healthy Mind series. I'm a psychotherapist, it's my day job, but I think games are very valuable as therapeutic tools to help us improve our mental health and our lives in general. So today I have uh, the great pleasure of talking about Uno. Yep, this is the one, the one that you know. Uh, I've used this game so much, don't even have the box anymore. There's not a prayer <laughs> that that box would last. Um, if I had to count my plays of games and therapy, this would win by a landslide. It wouldn't even be close. I play Uno all of the time, at least once or twice a week. And I want to share with you what is magical, uh, where the magic is in my use of Uno. But first, uh, I want to uh, go to the table and show you how the rules as written work. And then we'll get on to some other fun stuff. So without further ado, let's go to the videotape. All right, so here I have a, a two-player game laid out of Uno. So in, in some ways, this is a silly video, um, a rules explanation for Uno. I mean, who doesn't know how to play Uno? However, I wanted to do this very quickly because not so much to explain the rules, but to explain what is an actual rule <laughs> and distinguish them from house rules. So um, everybody's going to get seven cards, and on your turn, you play one card for very few exceptions. In fact, I can't think of any exceptions in the normal rules. You play one card. So if I go, I'd have here. Uh, the rule is you can match the number or the color. So I got the color over here. I'm going to play that. The opponent will go. Oh, no. He matched the number. But now, or she. But now I, I can't um, follow up because I don't have the number or the color. So I pick. I did not get a great card. So I do not keep on picking. I pass. You pick once and you pass. All right, uh, so that's basically um, a lot of the gameplay. So they're going to keep going. Oh, my goodness, they're going to hit me with a powerful card. The attack card, the draw two. So I am stuck drawing two. So you might recognize, oh, I have a draw two in my hand, so I can just counter. Nope, once again, not in the basic rules. I just draw two, and I take it. Um, so obviously this person would have lead position, and we will go back and forth. Uh, dumping all of our cards until one of us is out of cards. Uh, there are a couple of other power cards over here. Very self-explanatory. Skip, you skip a turn. Uh, reverse, you kind of reverse the order. In a two-player game, they function the same way. And then you have the dreaded draw for wild and other wilds in there as well. So you're going to go back and forth um, until one person is out. Let's say they manage to get rid of all of their cards. I get rid of a few of mine. I would add up my score, whatever that is, and I'd uh, I'd be count 20 points because these are terrible cards I have in your hand at the end of the game. Uh, and then I would give that to the other player. And in the classic rules, the first player to 500 after multiple games is the winner. So if you are a veteran Uno player, you're probably screaming at the screen right now. You forgot one of the most important rules. It's the name of the game. So if this player were down to one card, and did not say Uno, the penalty for that, um, they would have to get called out, and the penalty would that would be to draw two additional cards. Um, not four, not seven, <laughs> just two. Um, but if they did call Uno, they'd be able to check their hand and see if they could play the card, and if they can't, they would pick and pass. Um, so that is how to play Uno. Uh, sorry about that, people. If uh, <laughs> I get called out as a video reviewer, I'm going to go ahead and draw two cards and move on. All right, so that was Uno at the table, rules as written. And if I was just reviewing that, then five out of 10. <laughs> uh, there's not much there. It's just a very, very lucky game. You're at the mercy of the cards. Can't really do too much with the one card per play and all the other rules. Um, but uh, there are a number of house rules that people use. And everybody uses different ones. Everybody uses them uh, in different ways. So let me go show you some of the more common house rules and come back and show you what I think. So let's go back to the videotape. All right, let's get to the fun stuff, which is some house rules. First of all, um, pick and pass is a, a natural rule, but I think a lot of you are familiar with pick and pick and pick and pick until you get the card and you're able to play it. So... I'm going to keep on drawing, and I'm going to keep on drawing some more. And uh, when I was a kid, and I draw a lot with my dad, my dad will sing a song. Pick, 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 
pick, pick, pick, pick, pick, pick, pick, pick, pick. Holy moly. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and you would end up with this nice fat hand of cards <laughs> and have to deal with all of that. Another rule variation adds penalties to misplays and add penalties to mistakes. I showed you before, let's say I'm over here and I, I forgot to call Uno, I play my card, and I did not say Uno. I can get two, four, seven, as many cards as you want, <laughs> as many cards as your game group can afford. Also, another variant that I've seen, let's say I try to be a sneak, look at that. I'm going to turn this one around, I'm going to be sneaky, make it look like a nine and play that nine on there. Ooh, <laughs> I'm taking advantage of the 6-9 ambiguity or anybody who's frequently prone to mistakes. Oh, look at that. All of a sudden, they can get a penalty as well. So no more shenanigans, 9-6 man. Get out of here. All right, so let's get to some ways that we can affect the actual game flow. So uh, as I said in the old rules, you can only put one card at a time, but you can play with stacking. So I got a nice, delicious um, green card there. Under stacking rules, I can take any number of cards that match the next number I'm going to play and stack them up. So there's a couple of ways that you can do that. You can either, uh, if you're playing with younger players, just be like, you know what? I get rid of all my fives. Bang. Or the little bit more strategic way is that you can play them one at a time. You allow the other player in order to respond. So then after you play that, you got something, you got something, you got something. Oh, look at that. Uh, that person's going to interrupt me playing my last five. So... Uh, a way to kind of like speed up the game, uh, get some more cards going down there at once. All right, so I've introduced a third player to illustrate the next house rule, uh, pretty common that I've seen, which is the uh, exact card follow. So let's say I play this red six over here, and this person is about to load up and play, but oh, out of turn, this person was paying attention and saw that an exact card was played so that you can kind of jump in there, mess up this person's mojo, and mix up gameplay that way. All right, so this might be one that is familiar to a lot of people, which is a variation on stacking called power card stacking. All right, so this guy thinks he's slick. He's going to throw a draw two down on me, but I have been holding on to this for just such an occasion. Instead of just picking the draw two, I can match that and draw, make him draw four. <laughs> but then he... <laughs> Oh no! So it could kind of keep on going back and forth as long as people have draw twos. So at this point, if there have been three draw twos played, I would be playing draw six. Now at this point, uh, you can just draw the six and say the draw twos are the stackable ones, or you can play with another variant that says, you know what, I'm trumping this. <laughs> We're going to throw down draw four, so that was six plus four. You're going to draw it dead, my friend. Yeah! I do a little happy dance, and then he goes and sulks, and then says, too bad. Draw 14. <laughs> Tell me in the comments below how many cards you have drawn um, as a personal record for you. All right, you thought that was it? <laughs> no way, Jose. I have uh, all the variants that I've shown you as with a single uh, deck of Uno cards. However, what has become more and more popular is to take a whole nother Uno set, take all the good cards, especially you know who, Shuffle them in, let the strategery begin. And if all that is not enough variety for you, each modern Uno deck comes with custom wild cards, blank cards that you can write on. Uh, many, many games do that. Many games give you blank cards, but they uh, mostly just sit there in a box. For Uno, people have taken full advantage. There's lots of creative rules, like this one, uh, which got 14,000 retweets, <laughs> people commenting all over the place. Uh, and not only can you put them in your game, you can make memes out of them. Uh, this one's a little bit old and played, but you know what? <laughs> the classics never die. Uh, and uh, as a 90s kid, if you throw Rick Astley into anything, then I'm down with it. All right, so that was Uno at the table and also with some popular house rules. So now I'd like to break down, um, I think I've isolated four particular ways in which Uno... Um, kind of puts things together as like a secret sauce, so to speak, on why Uno in particular, not any other game that I've ever played, mass market hobby or whatever, Uno uniquely is a game that I'm going to go to over and over and over again. So the first one is a very clean and intuitive rule set. Um, 
I could teach this game and I'd never have to refer to the rules again. The only time people mess up a rule in Uno is when they know something different. Uh, they come at it with some kind of like precondition. Oh, you can't do stacking or I have to pick and pass or whatever it is. Um, if it's just like a clean, uh, not that I meet many of them, but they do exist of people who don't know anything about Uno. When I can teach it, it's just bang, done. Um, even the smoothest mass market games are, you know, kind of like, you know, different designs. They may have this little like unintuitive spot uh, where it just kind of like makes somebody think twice. So you think of, you know, I, I don't play a ton of checkers. Uh, but you know, when I when I put it down, it's like, okay, where does the queen go? How do I line this up on a red, red or blue? Um, I, you know, a little bit silly, but it's like, you know, it doesn't. Um, like it's, it, I don't know, like I just, it doesn't stick in my head as well as you know some of the rules in Uno, uh, or even like you know something like Monopoly, where you know, which I I play Monopoly in therapy too, and you know, every time someone passes free parking, um, they don't believe it. <laughs> Why would you, you know, why is that exciting to be able to roll land on a space and nothing happens? Uh, that's not exciting at all. That's, that doesn't feel like an intuitive thing. So people's like, oh, well, maybe just throw some money in there, luxury tax or whatever. Um, the auctioning is a, is a rules is written thing and a monopoly, which isn't something that people gravitate towards naturally as well. Um, so just like uh, look at a lot down the list of a lot of games people play. You, you might have that one little moment of let me go check the rule, the rule on that again. Or uh, that doesn't make quite a lot of sense. Uno has none of that. It is as close to a frictionless game as I can possibly think of. So that's number one. Number two is that it has the safest and in many ways of most satisfying uh, relative to how simple a game it is, a version of Take That. Are you a person who's has ever wanted to just kind of misbehave? <laughs> Do you ever look at somebody and, you know, uh, just like for that flash of um, like of time period where it's like they they cheese you off or maybe they got promoted and you're whatever. Or they're, they're more beautiful than you. Or they're smarter than you or uh, something. And it's just you just want to. <laughs> you know, and, you know, some people, um, you know, they talk about it or they don't talk about it or like they, they feel it and then they feel gu immediately guilty because like, you know, the, the inner kind of like, you know, guilt police kind of comes in and says, no, 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 you can't feel that way about somebody. Um I think from a psychotherapy perspective, uh, we've always known as psychotherapists that people have kind of um, like more darker, baser urges uh, down below, down below like the veneer of civilization. Like, you know, you have uh, Sigmund Freud from very, very long ago talked about the id. Uh, the id is our animal instincts to mate and to, you know, drive for pleasure and drive for dominance, you know, drive to, or, or at least, you know, um, for vengeance when you feel like you've been wronged, you know, why is this person prettier or more successful than me? That's not fair. <laughs> Uno is uh, a game that provides that magic circle. You talk, I talk a lot about magic circle uh, in gaming, like, you know, where that is that space where you can unleash that in, in, in a very safe way. Like you can just, you know, someone's about to go out and you just bah, draw four, take that. <laughs> or, you know, um, they think that their game's going to go somewhere and then blah, reverse is going to go another way. And I've definitely seen people really, really get into it and just, it's, it can be really savage, you know, <laughs> or maybe, you know, like this, this particular picture here where you're holding a whole bunch of draw four and it's like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> you feel really bad. But you really don't. <laughs> you don't have to feel bad. Just shuffle up and play again. Um, so that you just kind of like safe schadenfreude. Uh, <laughs> that safe instinct to, to dominate and to kind of even take pleasure in, you know, uh, uh, hurting somebody. Because at the end of the day, you can always say it's only a game. We're having fun. Uh, we're connecting. Uh, and I find Uno does that great. And I that's especially valuable to me when it comes to my work with teenagers. I work with a lot of teenagers. And they don't play hobby games. I think people know uh, who have teenagers. They're not going to sit there and play your Agricolas and your King of Tokyo's and anything. But they'll play Uno because teenagerhood, like the mental space of a teenager, is they want to be in that combative, you know, me versus mom space. And they get all that pressure to be, you know, like, let's you know, be a part of the family. Why don't you guys, you know, come out with me? You know, why do you do that? Ugh. Whenever, you know, I, I ask you to do something, uh, there's that resistance there, but then you, you bring them to the table and they can express that resistance fully uh, and differentiate themselves and be uh, <laughs> engaged in that little bit of take that, um, again, in a safe space. The third element, so that, those, are, those two things are all great. 
Uh, and like I said, you need all four of these elements in order to explain the magic of Uno. Uh, so the third element is the house rules. So I don't know a single person who plays rules as written. Um, that that's just a pure kind of luck fest, and you know, there's, there's not there's no game there. It's just an activity, really. Um, but now you're introducing the those house rules, and especially especially uh, introducing extra sets of the powerful cards: draw fours, draw twos, reverses. When you get a buy a second set and you shuffle those in. It becomes a strikingly, surprisingly strategic game. And I was turned on to that um, a, in a New York Times article, of all things, uh, that talked about uh, the basketball team, the Atlanta Hawks, and how they play Uno all the time <laughs> on their uh, trips and everything. Um, they get into it. They bet money on it. Um, and they talk about how strategic a, a game it is. You know, like when do you draw? You know, if you have a hand to draw twos, do you uh, also introducing that that rule where you can kind of like stack the power cards and like draw two, draw four, draw six, draw eight. Um, you know, do I hold back and do I take the six so I can have a little bit of, uh, you know, ammunition later so I can combo later? Um, you know, there's there's a lot of surprising um, strategy that goes into it. And, of course, you know, the hijinks of when you introduce all that stuff, you can make somebody draw 50. <laughs> My personal record is 26. Uh, that's the most that I've ever, ever drawn. And like I said above, I would love to hear about your personal records below. Uh, and, you know, it, it does a couple of other things. The house rules, it creates a sense of ownership. Um, you know, like people, it's, it's their game, you know, and, and nobody can take that game away from me and people, you know, you negotiate those house rules and, you know, like I let in psychotherapy, if someone has their house rules, I'll play with their rule. I'm not going to interject my rule. Now they've, uh, taken ownership, whoever it is. And usually a teen, uh, it's very valuable for a teen to give them a little bit of ownership, play their way, so to speak, uh, makes them feel a little bit more involved. I want to spend... Uh, just a little bit more time here, um, because I think that that g uh, gamers, right? And, and I don't want to uh, belabor the point too much, but I definitely sense the spirit in the community sometimes where there's a real gatekeeper instinct. Uh, there's a real instinct towards purity and saying, well, that's, you know, you're, you're, that's nice that you're playing whatever, but you have to play the real way. You know, that's not a real game. You know, uh, because if you have to make a whole bunch of house rules to fix it, then it's not worth, you know, uh, playing or we can't really say it's a great game, can we? <sighs> yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, you know, like rules as written, it should be a launching point to fun. It shouldn't just be the outer barrier and then we have to keep our fun, quote unquote, within. Uh, and I think hobby gamers were used to it because, you know, game designers put a lot of effort into, like, make, putting all the fun as, as in the box as much as possible and then doing, like, little safe variants here and there, like solo variants or whatever. But there are people out there that take their very simple games and they make it their own and they're gamers. And I really feel like uh, as a community, it's not that mentally healthy to kind of, like, really drill down on that purity instinct that gatekeeper instinct we're a lesser community for it we can come off as yeah i don't want to say anything too mean but i i just you know i don't want to i feel like we come off very stuck up i'll just say it you know i feel like we come off as uh, people that have high walls and we're not welcoming to all sorts of people um, who want to play and who are genuinely gamers by engaging in a game like this and the house rules isn't house rule just game design, you know, fixing a game? So I really want to help us check that uh, instinct, that mental instinct to kind of like purity and gatekeeping. Uh, Uno's a game. And I don't care what's in the rules is written. As long as you're having fun, as long as it's within the, the outer spirit of what the game is doing, then it's perfectly valid. And the fourth thing uh, that I want to um, emphasize, which has a lot to do with that accessibility piece I just mentioned, it's an abstract game, and I think that's actually really valuable in terms of um, helping people feel like there's no barrier uh, to entry. You know, you think of like the um, like games, like if it's Battleship, but you know, like there's people who it's a war theme, and that's like like ships launching things at each other. So like there, I like you get that. You know, people kind of overcome it eventually, but you know, that's a theme that not everybody's going to resonate with. Or chess, even surprisingly, with like the kings and the queens and the bishops and all that. I mean, like, there's a lot of games that we play that have a lot of cultural baggage. 
uh, sneaking in there. And if you're in that culture, you're not going to notice. But if you're outside of that culture, you're looking at it going, oh, that's not my game. Uh, or even the ho- like, you know, hobby games, I think, are even more like this. You know, you get your fantasy themes and your, you know, fairy tale themes or whatever it is. And they all have a, a Western European uh, lineage. Uno has none of that. Uno is colors and numbers. And that is so amazingly simple and so amazingly inviting to folks. And I've witnessed, witnessed this personally. I've played a lot of games with gamers who are just, well, with gamers who are not quote unquote gamers who don't know anything about us. Um, I've played, I hang out a lot of inner city. I'm an inner city kid. I come from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and my work as a social worker leads me to Brownsville, uh, you know, the way <laughs> neighborhood, way uh, deep in Brooklyn. I've worked in, you know, uh, inner city Hartford and different places. And I've worked, um, you know, in the African American community among uh, Latino, uh, Latina community, um, you know, different, uh, persons of color where the gaming, pat- the, the gaming heritage is, as a present, and they're playing Uno. In those communities, everybody knows Uno. And if I'm a gamer, and it's not like Monopoly, Uno's the next one. And Uno just, Uno, like a Monopoly, like people kind of like, you know, they have like feelings about it. Uh, but nobody has any feelings about Uno. Everybody just plays it. And everybody has a great time. And, you know, I, I just kind of want to throw this out here at the very, very end of this review because I don't want to get too far into the the, the P word uh, politics, but on a human level, and this is something I encounter in my work. I mean, I've seen a lot of um, you know young men in prison, you know, well mostly black, and that's kind of the reality in America nowadays. Uh, and they're playing Uno, you know. Um, I was really affected when you know, I, I I read more into the Breonna Taylor case. And one of the things that she did with her boyfriend almost all the time was play Uno. And that was, I think they were either going to play it or they did play it on the night that she was unfortunately um, killed. So, um, and I could just see it in my mind's eye because I've had that experience of, you know, just being everywhere in the dingiest places um, or nice places that are in the middle of a dingy neighborhood, (laughs) you know, like a youth center or something like that. And they're playing Uno. Up and down, left and right, rich and poor. Um, it just feels like because of those four points, because of the easy access, because of the house ruling, the malleability of it, because of uh, the take that and the fun of the, that the magic circle it creates and also just kind of like the, the ex- abstract, no cultural baggage kind of nature of it. Put those all together and you have an amazing game that I will always use in therapy. So this one, no reservations whatsoever. This one is getting the highest seal of excellence that I can possibly give it. Um, Again, you know, and maybe that's a little bit weird, but I invite you to get past the rules as written and think more broadly about the fun that a game like Uno can open up for gamers, non-gamers, and whoever. So this is Jason reminding you, if you can change your mind, you can change the world. So until next time, later, everybody.